everybody and welcome to night number six of history bedtime stories in our pajamas live from bed we got some big news today the big three which in detroit means four general motors and chrysler have agreed to shut down their factories the assembly lines are going to stop so that employees can go home and practice social distancing to try to flatten that curve and that got me to thinking about factories and assembly lines and other times in history we've shut those assembly lines down so i went through my postcard collection today and i found this wonderful postcard mailed in 1925 on the back there's this great image now this is called the most expensive photo ever taken when it's published in time magazine do you see all these people in here Henry Ford shut down the line at the Ford Highland Park factory, gave all of his workers two hours to go outside and stand in the green space on his 102 acre complex in Highland Park to have Time Magazine take this photo. It was called the most expensive photo ever taken because Time Magazine said it would have cost Mr. Ford a million dollars an hour to stop his line. As we're talking about the line stopping today, there's a great photo on the front of Highland Park. And here, a different postcard shows you a wonderful back photo of the complex spread across nine buildings and 102 acres. It is designed in 1908 by Albert Kahn and Associates. The building opens in 1910 and it becomes the biggest assembly factory in the world at the time it opens. And this is part of Henry Ford's idea to bring everything under one roof. So you'd have offices, foundry work, glass works, rubber works, you'd have machine shops, you'd have uh, research and development, all in one big complex, sort of a soup to nuts way of building cars. On October 7th, 1913, the Ford Motor Company goes one even better because it roars to life with the first moving assembly line in the world. This assembly line covered four miles in length and it took the production time of a Model T from 12 hours and 30 minutes in 1910 to 93 minutes in 1917. And that drops the price of a Model T drastically from $700 in 1910 to $350 in 1917, making that car, the 10 Lizzie, the most affordable car on the planet. And it's why by 1920, one out of every two cars on the entire globe is made here in Detroit, truly making us the motor city. But Ford has a problem. As his assembly line is running faster and faster, what used to be skilled labor, several men building a car from start to finish, doing every part of the production, turns into unskilled labor. Many, many people on a line doing one repetitive task all day long. So you might be the guy who puts on the nut. Then the guy next to you might be the one who tightens it. And then the guy at the end might be the one who does a final check and assembly. And then behind him, there's somebody who greases it. And behind him, there's somebody who paints and puts in the seats or puts in the glass. With all of these divisions of labor, the work started getting incredibly boring, incredibly repetitive, and physically dangerous. Because of this, the Ford Motor Company was facing terrible recidivism and absenteeism in their factories. Basically, people weren't showing up. And this was a huge problem because although the work was simple, you had to be trained. And training new employees constantly was expensive for Ford. And it drove up the bottom price of those automobiles to customers. So when Ford starts seeing numbers like 34% absenteeism in his factories, he puts his head together with many of his vice presidents and together with his VP, James Cousin, who later goes on to become a Detroit mayor, and we'll talk about that another time, they come up with an idea, the $5 a day wage. Now to all of us, five bucks doesn't sound like that much money, but when Americans doing unskilled labor were used to making between two and $3 a day, now the Ford Motor Company announces that they will begin paying every man who meets their strict qualifications $5 a day. On January 5th, 1914, it triggers the greatest migration of Americans in this country's history. More people flood into Detroit chasing that $5 a day wage than go to California for the gold rush. It gets so bad and there are so many people in Highland Park kind of like cramming and banging and trying to get in 
that the Ford Motor Company actually turns hoses on people in a Michigan January winter to keep people away from the doors. At the same time that he starts paying $5 a day, he takes the workday from nine hours to eight hours. But in exchange for this, workers have to agree to incredibly difficult requirements. First of all, production had to go up. You didn't just get $5 a day. You maintained your regular $2.30 a day paycheck, but you were eligible for a bonus up to $2.70 in addition to your pay if you met the production goals. So now you have bosses walking the line going, you gotta move faster. You want Henry Ford to pay? You want that $5 a day? You gotta keep going. We've gotta build more. Come on, men. Production has to get up. This gave people something called Ford gut. It's a euphemism for ulcers or indigestion from the stress of the assembly line never stopping and production always having to go faster. In addition to that, the Ford Motor Company was sort of nosy. They wanted employees to live the way they thought was appropriate. So Ford mandates that workers have to contribute to their own savings accounts. Their homes can be inspected by the Ford manufacturing company at any time. And if they're found to be unclean, there isn't um, well cared for children, food isn't being cooked in the American style, or God forbid, you are hurting your wife or children, the Ford Motor Company would dock your bonus and not pay it until the problems were corrected. This created a lot of strife, but perhaps no rule was harder or more crazy to understand to our 2020 brains than the fact that Ford Motor Company employees had 20 minutes for lunch. 20 minutes to eat. And that meant 20 minutes from the moment your boots left the line to the moment your boots were back on the line. If you were a minute late, your job would be given to one of those guys outside, begging for a job, men who a hose was turned on in January, one of the hundreds of thousands of people moving from all over the world, including other states in America, here to Detroit, to chase that job and that pay. Because of that, diners and restaurants are opened all around factories, and there's still one in existence. It's called Red Hot's Coney Island, and it opened in 1921 in Highland Park. It was right across from the Ford factory, so when the lunch whistle blew, the men could run off the line, jog across the street, race into this tiny little Coney Island, and grab a paper bag. The workers at the Coney had already put two Coney dogs, which is a hot dog chili, mustard, and white chopped onions in a bag with a few napkins. You grabbed that and your coffee, ran back out to the street, opened up your newspaper, ate, and made sure you were on the line long before that 20 minute end of lunch whistle blew. And today, I've got a really exciting prize for anyone who likes and comments in the section down below their favorite way to eat a hot dog, whether it be boiled with just ketchup or a Coney Classic, we're going to put you into a drawing on Monday to win a brick of chili from Red Hot's Coney Island. It is still owned and operated by the same family and they are amazingly lovely people. And today they make their chili for carry out as a frozen brick. You just add water and heat it up. It's enough for four people. And you're also gonna get a jar of the owner Rich's world famous spice mix, which is good on just about everything. So like and comment in the um, comment section. We'll draw a winner on Monday and get to you by private message. And you'll be able to pick up your dinner for four chili at Red Hot's when they are open Tuesday through Saturday. They are currently still open for carryouts and they hope they'll see you soon. Guys, wash your hands. Let's cheer on the fact that the lines are closed, but remember it's not a snow day and we need to be socially isolating to try to help flatten that curve. Be nice to each other and we'll see you tomorrow night.